So now, when Jesus raised from the dead, and Mary and the disciples went to the, to the grave where the stone was, they saw it was rolled away. Right? All of y'all know that. And they saw Jesus wasn't there. And they were, I'm sure they were full of joy. I mean, they were, they were like, well, they started remembering what he said he was going to raise again in three days. And I'm sure they were thinking about that. And the stone was rolled away. It wasn't so Jesus could come out. It was so they could see that he had been resurrected. Because Jesus could walk through walls. Right. Okay. So the stone was rolled away for us. So we could see that he was gone. That he was resurrected. It didn't last very long. Because they went into hiding. There's a point in this. So stay with me. They went to hide. The Mary and the disciples. When the, the, all the ones that went to go see that Jesus wasn't there. They were, they were scared because they killed Jesus. And they were, they were starting to kill Anybody who believed in him or wanted to follow him. So the Bible says the Bible says that they were scared. In John chapter twenty, verses nineteen and then twenty one and twenty two, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now these these are men of God. These are Christians. And they, were, they had fear of the Jews. Because like I said, they were killing the believers. Why weren't they out there witnessing? Boldly, like the Bible says. We're supposed to be out there boldly witnessing. Telling people about Jesus. Like it says in Ephesians 6.20. It says, We are ambassadors, okay? For which I am an ambassador in bonds. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So when we go out there and tell people about the Lord, we don't do it like wimps. We don't do it like... It says, God said, do it boldly. Mm -hmm. I've learned to do it boldly. It's because I let the Holy Spirit come out of me. Right. Not Jesse, the Holy Spirit. And I'm not ashamed of the Lord anyway. Yeah. So I speak boldly when I go out there. I used to go to the jailhouse... And witness. I used to go to the hospitals, just walk in the room and start witnessing. I used to go in the mall and just start go up to people and ask them if they knew the Lord. But we need. But but the less what the Lord says. He speak speak boldly about me. Don't be scared to talk about me. And then Jesus appeared to them in the room where they were at, and the doors. The, they said the doors were locked. So I'm sure either he walked through the wall or he walked through the door, but he appeared in the room. And in verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when, he had his, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now this is another, this is another place where it shows where these, these, they had gotten baptized. So they received the Holy Ghost already. But it was in them. But right here the Lord said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. He's talking about the baptism, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's what we're going to learn what it is. He told them that He would breathe on them. And that they would receive the Holy Spirit. In Ezekiel chapter 30, uh, 37, verses 9 through 14. God said He was going to breathe on Israel to give her life. Because He had scattered them. But he was bringing them back together. And he breathed on them. He gave them life. They got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He breathed life on them. Okay? Who else did he breathe life into? Well, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it was Adam. He breathed on Adam, and Adam had life. I mean, truly, uh, no dying life until they messed up. Okay? So, he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, Acts 1 8, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So, when we let the Holy Ghost come upon us, what are we going to get? Power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
So after we we get the baptism, the Holy Ghost coming on us, like I said, when we allow this to happen, some of us, a lot of us don't allow it to happen. We're scared of it. But if you let the Holy Spirit come on you or out of you, like I said before, it gives us power. It gives us power. And the rest of the verse says, And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and all of Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He gives us this second baptism so we can receive power. Think about it. Really, seriously, think about it. You let the Holy Spirit come, that's in you, we're all born again Christians in here, if you let the Holy Spirit come out of you, you're going to receive, you're going to have power. Amen. Power. Whose power? God's. God's power. Amen. Is there anything that can defeat our Lord? No. So, should we go out there as wimps? No. No, we'll go out there with boldness and we go out there with power. When we wait, because it says right here, and you shall be witnesses. We witness about him. Once you become a born again Christian, that's our, our ministry, is to tell people about Jesus. Now, what does he give the power for? To be witnesses. Is anybody listening to me? <laughs> so he gives us power to be witnesses. So we can witness wherever we go. We don't have to be like Jehovah Witness where we go door to door. He didn't say go to door to door. Back in the uh, Mark 16, he said, uh, as you're going, as you go is what it says. But the word go in Hebrew means going. So what he's saying is as you're going through life, you're going to run across a lot of lost people. And he wants us to witness to them. Okay, so that's what, this is what this power is, is for. So we'd have power when we go out and witness about the Lord. How many of us can believe that we have the power of God in us? Amen. We just got to let it out. We have it in us. Yeah. We just got to let it out. That's what we're just teaching is on. Why do we have the Holy Spirit? Well, we're learning why we have the Holy Spirit. And we're learning what the Holy Spirit gives us. It gives us power. In Luke chapter 24, verse 45 and then 49... It says, Then open he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. Did he say that band opened our understanding? Did he say college opened our understanding? No. That he, he opens our understanding on the Scriptures. And he does it. You can do it at home through the because you have the Holy Spirit. But there's gifts, and I'll get on this later, but there's gifts given in the church. And one of those gifts is teachers. So we do need teachers. Okay, but I'll, I'll get more on that later. But he opens our understanding. That's why when the, the Baptist church I was going to, the pastor wanted me to go to college because he, he felt I should be a preacher. And so, and I was a young preacher, I mean young, young Christian. And I prayed about it, but it's like the Lord spoke to me. He says, Jesse, you're doing what I want you to do. You're going to church, you're studying your Bible, and you're under a teacher. That's what I want. So I didn't do it. I mean, I, I have to hear from God when I do something. Okay? I have to. And I did not feel, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, the flesh part of me got all prideful. Oh, the preacher thinks I ought to be a preacher. But no, I had to go to God and see, okay, Lord, this, is, is this what you want? Right. I had to go to God and see if this is what he wanted. Not this man. I mean, I loved my pastor. He was a good pastor. But I wasn't going to do it because he was telling me, this is what you should do. Right. All right? And we have people like that. You know, they listen to men more than anything else. It says these men were scholars. I mean, these men weren't scholars. The disciples, they didn't go to college. They were just ordinary men. Just ordinary fishermen. You know, they were just ordinary men. But they learned from who? Jesus. From Jesus. Who's our Jesus? The Word. They had Jesus in the flesh. Right. Now we have Jesus in, in the book. We have to read. But they didn't go to college to learn all this. You know, if I want to be a preacher, well, I can do it either by going to a Baptist college so I can get ordained, or a Pentecostal college, whatever kind of college I want to go to, whatever religion. And then they ordain me. But that's not what the Bible says. I've given a teaching. What qualifies a man to preach or teach the Word of God? 
What does the Lord, what does the Bible say qualifies you to do this? And if you want to know, I got a teaching on it. It's not going to college. What he's saying here is what he said in John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Again, what's this area here? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Amen? Amen. That's who we depend on. If you're depending on your teacher or your teacher to teach you everything, everything you hear from me, I'm sorry, I'm not perfect. I'm not going to be 100% right. Okay? I'm a man. But if you learn from the, from the Lord and you read the Bible, then you got 100% right. If you're reading the Bible, there's no mistakes here. There's no mistakes in the Bible. So you read, when you're reading this, then you know, okay, I can believe that. Jesus is saying, I've taught you everything you need to know about me to his disciples. And he did. The, like I said, the, the disciples had the greatest teacher who ever lived, mm -hmm. Jesus. They walked with him day and night. And they learned all about him. Ooh. Yeah. I wish that could happen to me. but Really? <laughs> <laughs> you think then... You think then they were ready to go out and be witnesses. But Jesus tells them in verse 39. I mean 49. Excuse me. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Upon you. you remember what I, I said this before. You need to read every word. Even the littlest word is, is very important in the Bible. In, on, I, they, everything. The Lord did not waste any words in the Bible. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, he says, Stay in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high. So he's saying, Wait until I give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. Now remember, they were in a room with the doors locked, hiding, fear of the, of the Jews. When the Lord gave them this power, when, he, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, <laughs> we're going to see what happens. Remember, they were scared. These are Christian people who were scared. Disciples and women, Mary and other, the other Mary, they were, I mean, they were joyful. They saw the Lord. They saw Jesus. But they were scared. And they didn't get rid of that scaredness until the Holy Spirit, until the Lord gave them the, gave him the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is when they're going to show it. Now, this is the day of Pentecost. And Peter is speaking to the crowd, okay? In Acts 2, verses 32 and 33. This Jesus hath God raised up, and, for, and wherefore we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Now this is the day of Pentecost. Now those of you who know about Pentecost, that's when the disciples and all of them started speaking tongues. And that tongues was the tongues of other languages. There's three different kind of tongues in the Bible. Different languages. Like if I go to China and, and the Lord wants me to witness to somebody there, I'm going to be talking in English, but what's going to come out is Chinese. That speak, that's a, the same thing that happened here. They were speaking in other languages. And then you have the, the unknown tongue where it's, a, where it's just, a, just you and God, between you and God. And then you have the prophecy where someone in the church will stand up, speak in tongues, and then that person will sit down and another person will stand up and interpret what that person said. Nowhere in the Bible does it say everybody's supposed to be getting up and speaking in tongues. Okay, That's not the way you use it. It's individual it's for the church or it's for speaking in another language. These men got the feeling of the Holy Spirit and they had the power to be witnesses. On that day, they received the gift of speaking in tongues. Because like I said, they spoke in other languages. Then it says, which you now see and hear. What the people saw was men who were scared to come out in public. Because they knew that they were hiding, that the disciples and, and, and the women were hiding. But what they saw was these, they came out of hiding. 
They came out of hiding and started preaching Jesus. So it's right here. It says, what you, what you now see and hear, that's what he was talking about. They were coming out in boldness. Many people who are Christians, you can't see the difference in them. When you become a born-again Christian, you become a new creature. You have the power of God. These men and these women were out there witnessing. Doesn't matter if it was in their own language or other language. They were out there where they had the boldness. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit gives you is boldness to go out there and witness. So they're hiding and all of a sudden they get the Holy Spirit and they come out speaking bold, witnessing boldly. That's exactly what happened. It's like they were scared, hiding in a room. They got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is you allowing it to come. We allow it to come. We can, we can, I'm going to teach, I'm going to show later, we can quench it. We can not take it. But look at what happens when you do take it. You have power. Amen. Power. There's many Christians, I mean many. Christians, I'm talking about born again Christians, they do not use this power. They're sideline football players. You hear me? They're on the sideline. They don't want to be out there. One thing, you know, you're not very popular if you're out there preaching Jesus. It's not going to make you a, make you a very popular person because this is the world. And the world is evil continually. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible says we're no longer, we're no longer of this world. That's what the Lord said. So when you become a born-again born Christian, you are not going to be popular. So when you go out there to witness, if you're wanting to be accepted by the world, then you better not, you better not witness about Jesus then. But if you're really a true born-again believer, you will take the boldness, the power that He's given us, and go out there and do it. You'll quit listening to the devil, because believe me, the devil will tell you, oh, you're not going to be accepted, nobody's going to like you, or he'll use, you're too shy, or no, you know, you're too scared, or whatever. He'll give you 100,000 excuses on why not to go out there and witness, because he doesn't want to see people get born again. He doesn't want people to know about Jesus. And we, when we don't witness, what are we doing? We're pleasing Him. We're pleasing the devil instead of God. Because God told us to go out there and witness. He said, I'm going to give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the boldness. And like I said, it's up to us if we use it. And many Christians aren't using it. They are not using it. And when you do that, yeah, you might be eating lunch by yourself at work. Right. Okay? There's a lot of things you're going to be doing by yourself. But I'm not here to please them. Right. I'm here to please my Father. Amen. And I already know I'm going to be unpopular. I'm even unpopular among the Christians because I, I preach things they don't want to hear. So even among my own brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm, I'm unpopular sometimes. But that's okay. The Lord gave me this ministry. The Lord gave me the want, the will to do this. I'm just following Him. I'm just following Him. And when He says, hey, this is what I'm saying, then that's what I'm going to teach. And praise God, we have a pastor that way too. Our pastor preaches the Word of God. He knows he's going to offend people, but when the, when God, when the Word of God offends us, what should we do? Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Because we're not perfect. Right. So when, when, when the Lord is telling us this is what we should do or not do, we shouldn't get offended by it. We should thank Him for it. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that. Now, in the book of Luke, chapter 4, I believe it is, the first part of chapter 4, he was preaching in the church. They wanted to kill him because they got so offended of what he said. They wanted to kill him, throw him off the hill. Then the last part of chapter 4 of Luke, he went to another church, and those people were astonished. The word says astonished by his word, by his doctrine. They were like amazed. So there's two ways to take the word of God. You can be offended and go and and run away from it or you can receive it and do it amen, amen. so that's only you who can make that choice amen. in the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 1 it starts off telling why the Christians were all scattered which was because Saul not Paul it changes to Paul but Saul he was the one killing Christians and then in verse 4 it tells how these Christians 
who were scattering about went everywhere preaching the word. They were running from Paul, but while they were running, they were preaching the word of God. All of this happened after the resurrection, after the day of Pentecost. They weren't hiding. They were escaping from being killed by Paul, Saul, but they were still preaching. They were still witnessing. And in verse 5 and 6 of chapter 8, it speaks about how Philip went to Samaria excuse me, to preach about Jesus. And now remember, the Jews and the Samaritans, they did not get along at all. But Philip went to them and started preaching about Jesus. And they listened to what he had to say and they believed in the miracles he did because he was performing miracles. And then in verse 10, the Samaritans said to Philip, how, how great is the power of God? And then this, this, this Samaritan was seeing how great the power of God was. All right? And in verse 12, they accepted the things they were told about the kingdom of God and, and about Jesus. And it says they were baptized. Then down in verse 14, which you should have in your paper, it says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritan had received the word of God, they said unto them, Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now remember in verse 12, it says, They got water baptized, but now they're what? They're receiving the Holy, the Holy Spirit to come on them. That's what it's saying. Because they had already gotten water baptized. The word receive means to welcome. You welcome the Holy Spirit to come on you. Right. You want, we want the Holy Spirit to come on us. If you love your Father, you want to show His light. He is the light. The Bible says we're little lights. But we are lights. We're little lights. But they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They weren't scared. And then in Acts chapter 9, verse 3 through 6, and then 17 and 20, this is when Paul got saved after hearing. Now, now Saul, who was killing the Christians, now his name is going to be changed to Paul. And I'm going to go through that real quick. But verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined around, round about him a light from heaven. Now this is Paul, this is Saul. The light, he sees a light all of a sudden, coming from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why prosecutest thou me? Notice that, that the Lord didn't say, why are you prosecuting the Christians? He said, why are you prosecuting me? So Christians are what? Like God. Like God. Yeah. I mean, that's what it says here. Yeah. Why are you prosecuting me? So he's saying, the Christians are the ones that, that he's killing, but God says, you're killing me. Right. So what's that say about us? Hmm. We're supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be like God. Mm -hmm. We're in the image of God. We are supposed to, when we let the Holy Spirit shine, we are like God. Right. We're not perfect. But the Lord does say, we shine. And in verse 5, and he said, who out there, who art thou, Lord? So Paul Saul is saying, who are you? And it's, it's a question. Are you Lord? That's what he's saying. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou prosecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. So like again, Paul called him Lord. Which when he saw that he knew hearing somebody with authority. Okay, at this time. He knew he was, that's why he said Lord. But he didn't mean Lord like we mean Lord. He, he said, Lord, like someone with authority. That's what he was saying. And Jesus says to him, it's hard for you to kick against sharp pointed objects. That's what that means. And then in verse 6, and he, and he trembling and acknowledged said, now this is Paul or Saul. This is what Paul says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now right here is when Paul gave his life to the Lord. He got saved. Because now he's calling him Lord. Not one with authority. He's calling him Lord. He's calling him God. That's what he's doing. And for two reasons I say, I say that. Because in what, the first reason is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. 
12, verse 3, it says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accused, and that no man that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So that's another that's a reason right there why I say Paul got born again, because you can only call Jesus Lord by the Holy Spirit. I mean calling him Lord and mean it. Right. You know, anybody can say Lord. But I mean, right here, he meant it. And right here it says, you can only do that by the Holy Ghost. And the second reason Paul surrendered his life to him, when he said, what do you want me to do? Paul was ready to obey God. What do you want me to do? Do we do that? Do we do, have we, we learned that we're supposed to be witnesses? Is that what, or Lord, is that what you want me to do? Shouldn't be a question because he's already showed us. Yes, this is your ministry. This is what I want you to do. Right. Paul right here was ready. And that's the way we should be ready. Whenever the Lord speaks to us to do whatever. Witness or whatever it may be. We should be ready. We should be going, what do you want me to do, Lord? What is my purpose in life here besides witnessing? We should, we all have gifts. We need to seek your gift. You need to seek your gift the Lord has given you. I go to these prayer meetings and they have prayer warriors there. I'm not a prayer warrior. I like to pray, but I'm not a prayer warrior. That's not my gift. But you got people there, I love listening to them pray. I can feel the presence of God strongly when they're praying. I can't, I, like, there's no certain way to pray. You just pray from your heart. But listening to them, I'm like, they got the gift of prayer. So we all have gifts and we need to learn what our gifts are. But right here, Paul, as soon as he saw who Jesus was, he called him Lord and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Amen? Amen? Do we do that? Don't answer. But do we do that? Lord, what do you want me to do? Because when you surrendered your life to him, you no longer have your own life, right? right. God said to lose your life, you have to save your life, you have to lose it. Mm -hmm. So if we've lost our life and given it to him, okay, well now I know what I wanted to do. But now I've given you my heart. What do you want me to do? Amen? Amen. That's the way it should be. Amen. Then down in verse 17. And, An and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way of thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now verse 3, remember it says suddenly there was a shine round about him from a light from heaven. Well, that light was so bright it blinded Paul, Saul. It blinded him. This was the light of Jesus. Because it says in verse 5, it says, And the Lord said. So the Lord was talking to him. So this was the light of the Lord. And then we go to verse 8, and it says, He opened his eyes and he was blind. He opened his eyes, but he was still blind. Blind of, blind of what? He still didn't know who Jesus was. Even though his eyes were open, he was blind. That is the majority of the world. The majority of the world. They can see, but they're blind. And though I've told, I taught you before, who's, bl who, who's blinded them? Satan. Satan. It's up to us if we want to see. Right. But then down in verse 17, it says... Not only could he see physically, but spiritually also. Because Ananias laid hands on, on him and Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And not only do I know he was born again, but Ananias called him brother. So all these signs, all this shows that Paul got born again. And what happens when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Verse 20. And straightway, this is what happens when you let the Holy Spirit come in out of you. Straight and straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. He started telling people. He started witnessing the people. That's when you know you're moving in the Spirit. If the Spirit is inside of you, and I've taught this before, if the Spirit is inside of you and people don't see it, what's the Bible say? What reaches people? They're drawn by the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is in you and people can't see, you can't draw them to the Lord. Because right. the Bible plainly says they're drawn by the Holy Spirit. 
by the Father. Okay, so if you want if you want people to get saved, if you go out there and witness and you want them to get saved, be filled with the Holy Spirit so they can see your light. They can see Jesus. That's what's going to reach them. Now, like I said before, we can either be good witnesses or we can be bad witnesses. When you're not, when you're not walking in the Spirit, guess what? You're not being a very good witness. Because when you're not walking in the Spirit, what are you walking in? The flesh. Yeah. Where we are sinning. Listen to me. We are sinning when we're not we don't we when we don't allow the Holy Spirit to overflow in us or to come upon us. Ephesians chapter five, verse fifteen through eighteen. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly it's, it, it, it means cautiously. Walk cautiously. You know. Walk cautiously. At first, we need to do that. Like at first, I had to watch that I didn't cuss. But after you do that for a while, then you don't have to concentrate on it. It just don't happen. Alright? All right? Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He's saying, make what time you have, what time you have here, make it for the Lord. Is what he's saying. Give it to the Lord. Verse 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The unwise believer. Now, this is talking about Christians here, okay? The unwise believer, the unwise Christian who behaves in a foolish manner, tries to function apart from God's will. When you're, when you're not in God's will, you look foolish. That's what it says. You look for, and we do. If we're not walking with the Lord, we do look foolish. All right. Now, in the world, we might look smart or whatever to the world, but in, in God's eyes, He said, "You're not walking with me. You look foolish." And I believe that 100 percent. The only cure for such foolishness that we sometimes are in is to allow the Holy Spirit to come out of us. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to come out here. Out of us, we're doing the will of God. We're not, we're not quenching the Spirit. Which I'm going to get on that. And in verse 18, he says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying here, Getting drunk is a mark of darkness. And it's a mark of foolishness. That's what it says right here. And that being filled with the Spirit is being able to walk in the light, in wisdom. Again, we have the choice. We decide which way we want to walk. We want to walk in wisdom, in the will of God, or do we want to walk foolishly and satisfy ourselves? That's pretty much what it's saying. God wants you to walk with Him in His will. I mean, what good are we? What good are we to the Lord if we're not walking in the Spirit? Right. What good are we? You ask yourself that. Just ask yourself that. What good am I to the Lord if I'm not out there shining as the light that He He, he, asked me? he not ask. He told us when we're not out there shining in the light, we're disobeying God. You want to be. You want to please God. The only way to please Him is walk in the Spirit, and the only way you can walk in the Spirit is let the Holy Spirit come out of you. Because we all have them. If you're a born again Christian, you have them. We need to learn how to use the power of the Holy Spirit. And what I've been saying is in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Quench not the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. Let the Spirit come out of you. Let the Spirit come out. You want to please God? Let the Spirit that is in you come out. Let Him come out. And because you're rejected for doing that from lost people, so what? You're not here to please them. If they don't want to be around you because you love the Lord, that's okay with me. I'm not changing my life for them. I change my life for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Also in Ephesians 4.30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. This is a command from God. He said, Don't quench the Spirit. He says, 
Grieve not though. He's telling us, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit from coming out of you. If you do it, you're disobeying the Word of God. Now, if you really want to walk with the Lord, are you going to just willingly disobey Him? That's not walking with the Lord when you just, no, oh, I'm not going to do that. You're disobeying your God. In Amos 3.3, 3, he says, how can, three, how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? So you have to be in agreement with this, with God, if you want to walk with Him. I mean, Amos says it. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? Now, if you disagree with this, you're not walking with the Lord. I hope y'all hear me. Another illustration I'm going to give before I close. I taught on David, King David. Now, when he was a little boy, he took care of the sheep, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the, is the army of Israel went up against Philistine. And we know about Philistine, the giant. Now the army of Israel, of God, was scared to go up against that giant. The general and all his men were scared to go up against that giant. Here comes a little David who takes care of sheep. He comes along. He looks, what's going on? And he, sees, he hears that Philistine down I mean, degrading our God. He said, I'll go out there. I'll go face him. Because nobody else in, in Israel would face him. None of the armies of Israel, of God, would go out there and face the giant. Because he was a giant. They were scared of him. They were looking with these eyes. They were looking with their physical eyes. But David, who loved the Lord, I'll go out there. And they put all this armor on him. And he couldn't even move. He says, oh, no. I can't, I, I can't wear all this. They went, went out there with what he knew. All he knew was his sling and stones. That's all he knew how to use. So for us to go out there and witness, do we need to know what's in the, the whole Bible? Mm -hmm. No, we don't, get, we don't bury ourselves in this because then it's, you know, it's too much. Right. We use what we know. If the only thing you know is how you got saved, if that's the only thing you know, then that's all you need to reach somebody else. Because if it got you saved, he can get them saved. Mm -hmm. But David said, no, take all this out, off of me. And he went out there and what did he do? He slew him. Mm -hmm. And cut his head off. David and the giant. I mean, what was the... Is Goliath. it called Goliath? <laughs> Goliath, yeah. He killed him. He, 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 Israel, the army of Israel saw a giant. David saw the power of God. Amen? Amen. Can we learn from that? Mm -hmm. We can learn from that. We, we need to be like David and not like the army of, of Israel who was looking with their eyes at the giant and thought, oh, I'm not going out there. But David knew he had God on his side. Mm -hmm. can, that, can you walk a victorious life? Mm -hmm. Can we? Yeah. There ain't no reason why we can't. Hebrews, the last chapter. The last verses. Hebrews 5, verses 12 and 14. Now, does the Lord see you like this? The Lord's going to be speaking here. Is this you? Verse 12. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not on strong meat. Verse 13, for everyone that uses the milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their own senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So he's saying right here, these Christians, these believers, that's who he's talking to, instead of them being on meat, they're still on milk. You take Cooper. He is so cute. Everybody loves him. Come back in 20 years. If he's still acting the same way, is he cute? If he's 20 years old and he's still acting like that, is that being cute? No, that's not. And that's the way the Lord looks at us. Are you still on milk or are you on meat? We got on meat tonight. We learned about the power of the Holy Spirit. Now it's up to us if we're going to use it. Or we're going to just stay on milk and be like babies. You hear me?
-hmm. This is the Word of God. Yeah. This is the Word of God. That's what I teach. And right here, he's saying, are you still a baby or are you mature? Are you on meat? That's a question for us. Are we still babes or are we on meat? Are we growing? If you're not grown, most Christians, and I, I hate to say this, but most Christians are not hungry for the Word of God. If you're not hungry for the Word of God, you are not going to grow. Right. Just like we need food to eat, to be healthy, and we need it every day. That's the same thing about the Bible, the Word of God. We need it every day so we can be strong, healthy Christians and mature Christians. You think going to church once a week or maybe twice a week is enough for you? I tell you right now, if you think that's what it is, you are you are living a defeated life already. This is what gives us strength. This is what gives us power, and we have to choose. It is up to us to choose whether we want to use it or not. We have teachers in the church that are unqualified to teach. They're babies. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over. I've seen where people get born again, and not long after that. They put them in a the teaching position in the church. They are not qualified to teach. They are still babies. And we're bad at that. They know the scriptures. They know it. They have head knowledge. But spiritually, they don't even know who Jesus is. I mean, they know He died on the cross and resurrected. They know that. But they really don't know who Jesus is. Who did we learn Jesus is tonight? He's the Holy Spirit. And where is the Holy Spirit? In us. In us. Amen. There's a lot of people who don't know that. You have teachers that don't know that. I, the only reason I know it is because the Lord has revealed it to me. The Lord has revealed it to me. And if you want to know what a qualified teacher is, get my teaching. It's called qualif Qualifications for Preaching. The Bible will tell you who qualifies. Amen? Amen. Did we learn tonight? Oh, yeah. You feel like you have power? <laughs> don't answer that. Don't answer it because you won't know until you go on the street tomorrow. When you go on the streets tomorrow, you'll know if you, if you, if you got the power or not. If this didn't change you and you still go out there the same way, you heard but you didn't receive.